The rideshare companies claim there's a shortage of drivers and are offering big money to new drivers. But is there really a shortage of drivers? And just how easy is it to get the guaranteed earnings for new drivers? Hi, I'm Chad Gig Economist, and I've been a full-time gig worker for over three years. I actually walked away from a high-paying career with Microsoft to go into gig work. I initially tried driving for Uber and Lyft, but after a few months I realized I could make a lot more money and drive way less miles by working for Instacart, DoorDash, and Amazon Flex. Though I still perform Uber Eats deliveries, it's been well over two years since I last gave an Uber or Lyft ride. In fact, many drivers switched to food delivery. I was making, like, I would drive like 150, 200 miles a day to make like 100, 120 bucks. And then I got turned on to Instacart and DoorDash and Amazon Flex. And I was driving like a quarter of the miles and I was like making 200 bucks a day easy. As crazy as 2020 was, 2021 hasn't been all that much better for gig work. In fact, it's gotten worse because every app is saturated with way more contractors than they need. Combine that with the fact customer demand is down and it creates a perfect storm. Before COVID, I made enough money with Instacart alone, but now I have to multitask between 15 different apps to get by. As someone who follows news of the gig economy closely, I've been hearing about a supposed shortage of rideshare drivers for months. I've seen stories of drivers coming to make anywhere from $25 to $40 an hour because there are so few drivers to compete with. So when Lyft offered me $1,800 to complete 120 rides, I thought it was a sweet deal. If you do the math, $1,800 divided by 120 equals $15 a ride. The last time I had driven rideshare, I was only averaging about five or six dollars per ride, maybe seven dollars on a good day. This deal would essentially double or even triple my earnings. And considering that tips are not counted towards that $1,800, I figured I could make a cool two grand in less than two weeks. So I signed up and was pretty quickly onboarded. My goal was to complete 12 rides a day, Monday through Friday for two weeks in a row. I assumed if the demand for drivers was as high as I had heard, I'd be able to drive weekdays during the day and still have no problem knocking out a dozen rides every day. Was I correct? Technically, yes. You are technically correct. The best kind of correct. Here's a spreadsheet I put together of all 10 days I worked. Let me give you a quick tour. Column A is a date. Column B is the number of rides I gave that day. Column C is how much I was paid for the time and distance. By the way, the rate card for the Orlando metro area is a paltry 53.25 cents per mile and 8.25 cents per minute. I'd venture to guess Orlando has the lowest payouts for a major metropolitan area in the entire USA. Column D is for personal power zones, which is not the same thing as a prime time or surge zone where the demand is unusually high and rates increase. It's just a few extra bucks they throw you for being in the right place at the right time. Side note, I didn't see a single prime time zone the entire two weeks. You think with a supposed shortage of drivers that they'd be pretty common, right? Column E is streak bonuses for completing three rides in a row without going offline. It was always $15 and it was usually between 3 and 5 p.m. Column F is the in-app tips I received. I did get a few cash tips, but they were never more than a few dollars and even those were pretty rare. Column G is for toll reimbursements. When I used to drive rideshare back in 2018, Uber and Lyft would charge the rider the cash toll amount, which is slightly higher than the electronic toll charge. Back then, you would actually make a profit by taking toll highways, but now they charge the rider the toll at cost, which means it's a wash these days. Column H is for cancellation fees. These are pretty rare as I only collected three of them the entire two weeks. There were a few instances in which the timer ran out and I could have canceled the ride, but I waited because I wanted to complete the ride more than I wanted a few bucks in fees. Column I is the total earnings for the day. As you can see, half the days I worked, I made less than $100. I never made more than $150 any of the days I worked. And FYI, $150 has been my minimum goal for a while. Column J is how much I averaged per ride that day. Over the course of the two weeks, I averaged $8.58 for all 120 rides. I'm actually surprised it was that high, though I was correct when I predicted there was no way my average ride would pay $15. Column K is how many hours I was online that day. This includes all the downtime sitting around between rides. 
Some days I only worked between four and six hours. Both Wednesdays were both extremely slow. So I went home early, though the first Monday was quite busy, so I clocked out as soon as I hit my 12 rides for the day. Column L is how much I spent on gas per day. Gas was between $2.80 and $3 while I was driving, though I never pay full price for gas, and I get a rebate on every gallon I buy thanks to Gas Buddy and GetUpside. I highly recommend everyone use these apps, so check out my video about them. Links in the description below if you want to sign up. I spent a total of $143.10, which means each mile I drove cost about 7.7 .7 cents, which actually isn't too bad. Thanks, Gas Buddy and GetUpside. <laughs> Column M is how much I netted every day after subtracting the cost of gas from my earnings. Column N shows my hourly wage after expenses. As you can see, I didn't come close to making $20 an hour any of the 10 days. In fact, there were three days I was making less than $10 an hour, and one of those days I was making less than the Florida minimum wage of $8.65 an hour. I only averaged $11.73 an hour over those two weeks which is absolutely ridiculous. Finally, column O is how many miles I drove each day. Even on slow days, I was still driving 140 to 180 miles. I went over 200 miles three times. I rarely come close to driving that far doing delivery apps. Over the course of the two weeks, I drove 1,852.8 miles. That's about a third of an oil change cycle. Only the time and distance earnings for rides and the personal power zone bonuses were counted towards the guaranteed $1,800. Those earnings only added up to $829.54, which is $970.46 short of the guarantee. Tips, streaks, toll reimbursements, and cancellation fees added up to $200.60, but were not counted towards the $1,800. All in all, I grossed a cool $2,000.60. Though I netted $1,857.50 after gas. Oh, by completing this 120 ride challenge, I earned my buddy Tony King, aka Gig Mom, a $700 referral bonus. I hope she takes a nice vacation with that money. I haven't driven rideshare full time in nearly three years, so there were a lot of things about the job I had forgotten, none of which I had missed. Let's go over some of them. Probably the biggest takeaway from these two weeks are the fact there is absolutely no shortage of drivers. If there is, there's an even greater shortage of passengers. I was under the impression that demand for rides was so high and the supply of drivers was so low that I would be receiving ride requests all day, every day. That wasn't the case at all. There were times I would only complete one ride per hour. In fact, on both Wednesdays, business was so slow that I only gave a handful of rides and went home rather than sit in my car roasting in the summer heat or driving around wasting gas. Sitting down all day made my butt, legs, and ankles really sore. I forgot how much time you actually spend sitting down doing this job. Whenever I had downtime between rides, I would try to park somewhere so I could walk around and stretch my legs, but I only managed to hit 10,000 steps a day once, and that was due to taking a walk when I got home from work. So many of my passengers reeked of weed and or BO. I would spray the backseat down between every ride, but some of the people were so stinky that not even Lysol would cover it up. I would say less than half the riders would put their seatbelt on. I've never understood why some people would gamble riding in a car with a complete stranger and assume I'm a great driver and nothing bad could possibly happen. I would say more riders were likely to wear a mask than wear a seatbelt. Speaking of which, I didn't make my riders wear a mask. Wearing a mask in Florida in the 100 degree heat is just plain cruel, even in an air conditioned car. One of the reasons I was hesitant to do this lift challenge was because I didn't want to wear a mask all day. Even though the state of Florida dropped all mask requirements almost a year ago, Lyft wants all drivers and passengers masked up at all times. I would wear my Orlando City cloth mask around my neck like an ascot, the only time I would put it on is if I was going to or from the hospital or a doctor's office. Otherwise, I would tell every rider that they could take their mask off as soon as they got in the car. The vast majority of them would immediately pull it down and say thanks. Only a few said they would leave it on and only one person asked me to wear mine. I did because it wasn't worth arguing over. After all these years, a lot of passengers still do not know how to use the app properly. I can't tell you the number of times I went to pick someone up from a gated community and there was no gate code in the notes 
and when I would call them or text them to ask, they wouldn't answer, or at least not right away. They also don't know how to place the pin on the map to show exactly what building they're in or where on the property they're standing. If the entire apartment complex shares the same street address, the GPS will only take me to the gate. Trying to figure out where to go after that is a huge pain. I noticed that the Lyft app wouldn't warn me that I was about to take a long ride until I achieve silver status. Three days in a row, my first ride of the morning was from Sanford to the Orlando airport. Since I was trying to knock out 120 rides as fast as possible, I actually preferred shorter rides. I didn't mind going to the airport because it's in a more densely populated area, so I knew I'd have no problem getting rides once I was down there. But this lack of a long distance trip warning actually caused one of my riders to flip out when I realized he wanted to go about two hours in the opposite direction of my house and I had to cancel his ride. It's a long story and I'll make a separate video about that sometime. There are only a handful of helpful changes to the app since the last time I drove. The first thing I noticed was that when I would drop someone off at the airport, I would always get a ride pickup as soon as I drove onto the airport highway. It's a really nice feature because it means you don't have to exit the property and wait in the queue for an hour. All you have to do is make a lap and drive downstairs to the arrivals. Another improvement they made, also airport related, is a return to queue feature. Once you drop someone off from the airport, you have an hour to drive back to the queue and you'll go to the head of the line. I was only able to utilize this feature once, but it was worth it. I will say that the $2,000 I made for the two weeks of work was worth it. Making $1,000 a week as a full-time gig economist is a pretty good wage, especially in the Orlando market where earnings are lower across the board. But will I go back to rideshare driving? No, not a chance in hell. Those numbers don't lie. I was making absolute peanuts. Plus I was driving a crazy amount of miles. Who in their right mind would want to work a low paying, high mileage job like rideshare when you can make double or triple the money and drive a fraction of the miles with Instacart, DoorDash, Grubhub, Corner Shop, and the other delivery apps. I said it before and I'll say it again. Rideshare is for suckers, at least in my market. If you're in a major metropolitan city and you can average well over a dollar a mile after expenses, then it might be worth it. So I have absolutely no plans to continue driving for Lyft. In fact, I'm not just going to delete the app off my phone. I'm going to tell them to deactivate my account entirely. Perhaps I'll apply to become a driver again in a few months, but only if I'd be offered the same challenge. Otherwise, there's nothing Lyft, or Uber for that matter, could do to entice me to become a rideshare driver again, not even part time. The wages they're offering cannot compete with those offered by grocery and food delivery apps. Plus, it's a much more dangerous job. I hope this video was helpful to anyone considering becoming a rideshare driver. The guaranteed earnings and bonuses they're offering are pretty tempting, but bear in mind the only way to complete the challenges is to drive rideshare exclusively. Once the challenge is over, You'll be back to the paltry base pay, and in most markets, that pay is abysmal, so don't say I didn't warn you. If you watch all the way to the end, you are awesome. While you're here, be sure to check out the Geek2 podcast, which is live streamed every Sunday and Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Or you can download the audio versions on any podcatcher on Monday and Thursday. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you real soon. Bye.